Hello and welcome everybody to the Vampirella 50th anniversary year end grand finale panel. Last year at San Diego in person, and that feels like five years ago, we celebrated the 50th anniversary of Vampirella's first appearance almost to the day. That's where we kicked things off and over the next 12 months we've launched multiple great comics and much more. Today I'm joined by some of the top creators associated with the character and I'll now introduce them. My name is Vincent Faust on behalf of Dynamite. So we've got a ton of guests here. First, I wanna introduce Christopher Priest. If you're a comics fan and you don't know who Priest is, smack your head into a wall. Just kidding, but let's hype him up a little bit. Priest has had a historic 40 year career in the industry marked by achievements and milestones both on and off the page. He's credited with being the first African American editor in the comics industry, having worked in that role at multiple major publishers, including taking charge of the Spider-Man franchise in the 1980s at one of its most popular eras kickstarting the careers of legends like Peter David and Kyle Baker. He's written nearly every major character besides Spidey, we're talking Deadpool, Captain America, Green Lantern, Conan the Barbarian, Back to the World, Milestone, he was one of the architects for that ahead of its time publisher. After periods away from comics when he probably felt more sane, Joe Quesada and Jimmy Palmiotti dragged him back to the boundaries pushing Mar Marvel Knights with a monumental run on Black Panther, which heavily influenced an Academy Award winning $1 billion grossing film. In addition to some of the most criminally underrated comics of all time, like Quantum and Woody, The Ray and Steel, you may also be familiar with his recent critically acclaimed 50 plus issue run on Deathstroke. And let me breathe for a second. His legacy continues to grow on Vampirella. So everyone please welcome the one and only Mr. Christopher Priest. Hello. Hello there. Hi. Next up we have here, Tom Snagowski. Vampirella fans love him. And for good reason, back in 1993, he picked up the reins from Kurt Busiek as the primary writer of the newly relaunched character. And he stuck around for quite a while through the entire original Vengeance of Vampirella series, countless spinoffs and crossovers. It was the infamous yet cherished 1990s. So with a legion of great artists, Tom gave Vampirella a leather jacket, totally revamped her origin story and even killed her off in a hyped up event story. At the forefront of the bad girls trend, Tom was the primary architect of its poster child is likely the most prolific Vampirella writer ever. I need to double check the math on that. That experience and reputation translated over to writing for other favorites of yours like Buffy, Angel, Hellboy, and he's the only writer to collaborate with Jeff Smith on Bone. He was right there alongside Priest for Marvel Knights writing Punisher with frequent collaborator Christopher Golden. He's written over two dozen successful novels and maybe coolest of all, he has a graphic novel about a French bulldog attempting to take over the world, which may be semi-autobiographical. He's returned to Vampirella and picked up right where he left off with the new volume of Vengeance of Vampirella. Everyone, please welcome Tom Snagowski. Hi, Tom. Hi. Next, we have Megan Hetrick. Compared to some of the older gentlemen in this panel, Megan still has a relatively young career in comics, but she's already made a huge splash. She's the co-creator of the Vertigo series Red Thorn. She's done interiors and covers from Marvel, DC, Valiant, Image, and obviously Dynamite. Now she's one of the top cover artists and fans can catch her on Vampirella, Sacred Six, Red Sonia, Age of Chaos, and more. Welcome, Megan Hetrick. Hi, Megan, welcome. Hey, thank you. <laughs> and Lucio Perillo. Dynamite fans definitely know Lucio. He's probably been one of the most prolific creators with the publisher for years, going back a decade. He's extensively worked with nearly every publisher, but also usually has at least four covers or more every single month with us. And Vampirella, Sacred Six, Mars Attacks, Red Sonia, Deja Thoris, Vam Vengeance of Vampirella, and I definitely missed something there. So everyone welcome Lucio Perillo. Hi, everybody. Hi. And last but certainly not least, Matt Idelson is joining me in repping the internal Dynamite Squadron. He brings to the table at least 30-something years editing funny books. Though sure. certain databases list a Marvel Comics Presents issue as his first appearance because he wrote a story in it and they misspelled his name in the credits. <laughs> Today, he edits the flagship Vampirella title and spin-off Sacred Six and other Dynamite favorites like Mars Attacks Red Sonia, The Death of Nancy Drew, and some fun upcoming James Bond projects, which is another panel of ours. Other editing gems include the first Deadpool ongoing series, Ed Brubaker and Darwin Cook on Catwoman, and a whole ton of Batman, Superman, Green Lantern, and more. He and Christopher Priest first worked together on Kazar, and now they're back together like great buddies. And he fired me. I would do it again. <laughs> All right, everyone, there's our panel. Um, I want to quickly run through some news after I got through the overly long intros. 
So as this panel is releasing, Vampirella number 11 should be in stores now. Sacred Six number one just came out. And hopefully everyone is intrigued for more. Vengeance Vampirella number nine should be out, depending on when this airs. Vampirella Red Sonia number nine. And the final issue of our super fun crossover with Archie are out, should be out next week. Um, but just go to previousworld.com and double check that. The, re the recently announced Vampirella Trial of the Soul special is coming out in September, uh, September 16th to be exact, written by <clears throat> Bill Willingham of Fables and Elementals fame, art by Giuseppe Cafaro, who is real great, covered by Bart Sears, who knows his way around vampire antiheroes. And it is the first appearance of a new character named Prester John, an agent of heaven who is out to judge whether Vampirella has a soul and must be vanquished. Matt, do you have any addendum to that? No, I think you covered it pretty thoroughly. All right. You don't give everything away. Vampirel number 15 is, should be out in October and will be somewhat of a special issue as well. We'll be announcing more details soon, maybe in a couple minutes, but basically it will be a great jumping on point going into the second major phase of Priest's Run, and we're doing something fun with the art. And on the topic of new characters and first appearances, we'll just say to also keep your eye on Sacred Six, I believe. Again, more details soon. So there's our news. Now we're gonna get into the actual panel. So my first question, which I think applies to most of you, though you don't have to answer this, is comics is a medium with a strong emphasis on history, even though comparatively it's a young industry. That said, there are countless characters and publishers that disappear as the industry and audience goes through occasional shifts. Vampirella has survived across 50 years and three publishers. So what do you think makes this character persist against the sands of time? And anyone can kick us off. Well, it's got to be the costume. Let's start right there. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, and uh, uh, she just has a certain appeal. Vampirella has always been, what I like about Vampirella is that she's in on the joke. And what I mean by that is that, uh, Vampirella, more often than not, is making eye contact with the audience. And it's almost like the old Superman, Adventures of Superman TV show where George Reeves would occasionally wink at the camera. Um, she didn't take herself all that seriously. It was a fun uh, book. It, it was, uh, 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 you know, it, it was initially about uh, female empowerment and female liberation, women's liberation. So it had, like, you know, this engine working for it. But certainly just the, un, uh, you know, the, the unapologetic sexuality of the character has got to play the major role uh, uh, in, 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 uh, in the character's popularity. Because uh, even when the book was not being published, there were, you'd run into people at conventions cosplaying Vampirella. So she's always just been a very popular character. A younger perspective here? Yeah, it's the costume. <laughs> <laughs> I think over time, it's she just like all great characters, she represents a lot of different appealing things to different people, whether it's the sex appeal, whether it's, you know, the fighting for justice. I mean, that's a terrible example, but, you know, it's, yeah, you get six different Vampirella writers lined up, they're probably going to have six different takes on the character and they're all valid. I think our challenge as writers, uh, and, and, and the first thing that shot through my head when Nick Barucci hunted me down in uh, Connecticut uh, to, to, to pitch the book to me was uh, how do I breathe life into the character and, and how do I uh, move beyond the costume and move beyond the sexuality and move beyond the, the winking to the character, the winking to the camera uh, and how do I put depth and endow the character with dignity and purpose and so forth. And, and I've struggled with that a, a, a lot and just made some decisions about the character that uh, have pulled her off in kind of a different direction. So, you know, I keep referring to my run on Vampirella, you know, as, you know, the Kelvin universe uh, version of Vampirella, because surely after I get done, someone else will take the book and undo everything that I've done. But, uh, you know, my first thought was to sit down with the character and, and just logic, just take some, some logical steps through and go, who would this person be? What would she want out of life? And what, obstacles would be in her way uh, without disavowing or undoing anything that's gone before, but to, to, to find my own voice with the character and, uh, uh, and, and just uh, endow her with a, with a great deal of depth 
uh, and and uh, connect her more to the human condition. No, no just a quick uh, uh, opinion. Like I think because of um, on my artistic uh, point of view is because uh, uh, Frank Frazetta was uh, one of the cover artists uh, at the beginning. So I think he gave uh, to the to the the, the image. The, um, how do you say? Sorry for my English. It's not the best. So, <laughs> <laughs> but I think how how he painted Vampirella like two dimensionally with his brush strokes probably gave her the um, uh, this uh, solid three dimensional uh, uh, view that is in the in the mind of everybody for generations. It's probably like a couple of generations that still has his uh, paintings in mind. Probably it's one of the reasons why she's still so popular. Yeah. Beside all this, the story, the, the character, because she's very sexy and evil at the same time. But she has also like great artists for years and years. And always top quality artists for interiors and covers. So that's one of the, probably, I don't know. That's my artistic point of view. That's... My introduction to Vampirella was through Frazetta, so same yep. thing right there, where it's just like, nope, that's like, I didn't even realize that she was a comic character <laughs> until yeah. I dug into it a little bit, so. <laughs> Not just on velvet. What's that? Not just painted on velvet? Wow. <laughs> right. So I grew up like 30 minutes south of the Frazetta Museum, so it was just kind of like, all right, and it became my mecca, but um, yeah, I was a bit obsessive. Um, I know that that's kind of the same thing there. It's just like I fell into wanting to draw her and stuff <laughs> because of falling into like the Frazetta kind of mentality. <laughs> so. so where uh, Nikki hunted down Chris to give his take on Vampirella, Nikki did the same thing with me and, and enticed me with, how would you like to pick up where you left off 20 years ago? And it was kind of like, ah, I got to say, hey, let me think about that for a minute. It took like three seconds to say, yeah, I'll do that. <laughs> I'll, I'll come back. I'll come back to that. So that was nice just to basically be given the Snegoski verse. I get, I get to play with everything that I created in the original run. So that was, uh, that was quite enticing to be able to come back and do yeah. that on the character. And, and that moves into my, my second question here is that all that history um, – Fans can be notoriously invested in all that. And from a certain point of view, it all builds up to a rich tapestry for these characters. But what advantages and challenges are there writing or drawing the character with all that in mind or not? Um, I know uh, Pre spoke to this uh, uh, very briefly and Tom did as well. And I'd love Tom to kick things off on this one since he's, he is in fact referring back to his own work for the most part. Yeah, well, it was interesting. When I, when I originally took over after uh, Kurt Busick, left. I wasn't super, super familiar with the, with the, the character's history. So I had to do some digging and uh, read some of the old black, you know, the majority of the old black and white Warren magazines and kind of was allowed to kind of pick and choose what I liked from, 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 from the past stuff and uh, kind of shape the character into, they, they, they were, Harris was very interested in making the character a little more modern, taking it and bringing it into the 90s at the, at, you know, at the time and doing some different things. So I think that's why I was uh, allowed to tweak the origin a little bit. Um, of course, the, 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 the leather jacket, they, they, fought me, they fought me tooth and nail on the leather jacket. That was pretty funny because one half wanted the leather jacket and the other half didn't want the leather jacket. So uh, yeah, so there was a little bit of a battle there for uh, covering, partially covering her up. But um, yeah, I think, I mean, it was fun to play with, it's fun, it was fun to be able to pick and choose what I kind of wanted from her past um, and kind of craft my own particular direction for the character. So it was a little bit of both, a little modern, a little modern spin that I brought to it while uh, using some of the original Warren stuff as well. So, so, so Paul came up with this great little MacGuffin, this book of prophecy in his run where uh, uh, Vampirella is flipping through these pages and she sees there's all these alternate versions of herself, you know, and all these alternate origins. And I went, that's just pure genius. That's absolute genius because it frees us all to do whatever the hell we want. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'm so used to working at, at, at the majors where, you know, uh, 
Deathstroke can't sneeze without me running it past this phalanx of fact checkers. You know, has he sneezed before? Does he say achu or kerchu? You know, and it, it, you, you're locked into, you're so locked, so locked into the cement, cemented, the hardened cement of, uh, of continuity that is paralyzing. So I keep expecting uh, <coughs> the, the, the whip. Yes, I keep, I keep keep expecting to get slapped down on things, and uh, and more often than not, uh, Dynamite has been very open to uh, different writers being free to uh, create their version or their. Let's see what you know Amy Chu's version of Vampirella looks like, and let's see what these other versions look like. And I think that I think the reader is the one who wins. After all, I, I think we don't have to treat fans like they're infants. I mean. They can figure this stuff out. <laughs> we don't have to connect the dots for them. They'll do that for us. Yeah. I would be interested if, if Matt wants to jump in on this question because, you know, the perspective of an editor on this, as Priest was essentially speaking to, is, is very different in assembling the creative team and helping and advising them with any reference or not um, and how that all goes down. The challenge of history is difficult with this character in this era where everything's been rebooted so many times. You don't, you have to sort of figure out either what's the version that people like the best, which is hard because the audience is so many different generations now, or just what's the essence of the character that seems to be consistent through the different iterations of the character. Cause it's like, whether it was at DC or, you know, Marvel before everything in here, just reboot after reboot, your head starts to spin. There's just no way to really reconcile all these. So yeah, I mean, it's just like, all right, what do you want to do on the book? And he says, this is what I want to do. And it's like, that works. It's cool. It's different. And it doesn't openly violate anything that we couldn't do in my mind. Uh, so then I want to come back, coming back to some of the art stuff. Uh, Megan, I know a lot of fans dig your work, but it also strikes me that you approach each cover in any unique way in terms of how you pose Vampirella or other characters and, and your style. And just as Priest and uh, the main artist on that book, Ergen Gunda's, have inside the book, you've also depicted Vampirella in a couple different costumes and kind of different aesthetics on your covers. Um, can you speak to some of that and kind of where, where you start on a new cover? Um, <laughs> Matt and I go back through what, like 17, 18 emails back to back to back to back trying to figure out what might work best. Um, but a lot of times, like, if I have an idea, you're, you've you been pretty cool about just kind of letting me run with stuff, too. Uh, it's just stuff that I want to see. I draw for myself, and if somebody else likes it, great. So that's basically what it comes down. Like, the, uh, hold on one second. Puppy. I got a dog chewing on a door. So hold on one second. Get over here. You know, when you're doing five covers on a book every month or four, you have to be, you don't have to be as concerned with story specific with every single cover. You don't want them to start to look alike. Right. So or you can let the artists come in and kind of express themselves and be passionate and do something that interests them, the better cover you're going to get. It also right. I think helps with me doing, I do more of like the, uh, the final order cutoff ones. So it's, I'm not locked into telling a story on the cover necessarily. Like I don't have to tie it into what's going on in the book for the most part. Um, so it's, it's fun just kind of going through and having a little bit of free reign to <coughs> play around with it. Like the, uh, the one that I think I got the most feedback on was the, uh, the Art Nouveau looking one. And um, it was just neat to take a character and just take us uh, an art history style and throw her into it and just see kind of what happens. So uh, it, it, it's, it's fun with it. <laughs> Everybody's got the critter showing up. <laughs> well, I'm gonna shut her up. <laughs> but, uh, it's, it's fun going through, um, where I start with the cover is just bouncing ideas off of Matt. I do a couple mock-ups and then for me, I don't sit down with any real idea in my head at first. Um, I just kind of throw crap out of page and see what fits, <laughs> see what comes out of it. Uh, or digital screen in this case sometimes. Um, I just play around with it and just kind of figure out what feels right. 
So that's probably why there's so many different takes that I've done on her between, you know, that and the Art Nouveau and her sitting, eating ice cream and watching TV with some PJs on. Like, it's, it's just fun to kind of play around with her. So I didn't realize that cover was going to be a freaking prophetic cover, but... <laughs> All right, so now I want to move things to Priest. Issue 15 of Vampirella is on the horizon, and Sacred Six has, you know, as of when this, when this is happening, has just recently launched. You're known in part for your celebrated lengthy runs, like on Black Panther, like on Deathstroke. And in interviews, like you said, you've referred to your approach on Vampirella as kind of the Kelvin universe, or you've also said it's a little bit Netflix-inspired. Um, but I kind of thought that, especially in the early stretch, I'd say Black Panther was quite cinematic as well. And obviously some of that translated to cinema. Um, while thinking in, in that comparison, perhaps Sacred Six has some parallels in both the format spinning out of uh, Vampirella and, and a little bit the themes, which readers haven't fully seen yet, to the crew. So I wanted to know if, if you have any thoughts on those possible connections and if you could expand on some of the ideas you're approaching uh, Vampirella as well as Sacred Six with. It, that, that's very astute of you to make the connection between Sacred Six and the crew. Uh, only five people watching this will have any idea what you're talking about. But uh, uh, we, we had a, a, a kind of Black Panther spinoff series in, in the 90s called The Crew that was uh, passionately well received but Marvel canceled the book before issue one even hit the stands. Uh, and it had nothing to do with the crew or, or even with the sales of the crew. Uh, Marvel folded the crew into some sort of event, tying it in with eight other books and, and the event tanked. So they canceled everything associated with the event, even though we had nothing to do with the event, they would, we would just fold it in there because marketing, the geniuses at marketing thought that would be a good idea. Anyway. So, history repeating itself, <laughs> you know, uh, we're doing a, a group book that's kind of spinning out of uh, uh, our Vampirella series, and it's set in the same Kelvin universe as our Vampirella series. Um, but Sacred Six is, has, has, I think, uh, a much more serious tone. I think Vampirella, my Vampirella, it still has a, a, a somewhat of a lighter tone where it's, it's, uh, you know, Black Panther had a great deal of humor to it. Uh, Quantum and Woody, my book I created for uh, Valiant, that had a great deal of humor to it. Um, Sacred Six, not so much. Sacred Six is, is very dark. Ooh, spooky dark. Um, and uh, lots of people being very mean to each other. Uh, and it's a fairly complex book. Uh, and it's brilliantly illustrated by this guy, uh, 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 Gabriel... Gabriel, uh, please tell me it's a bar. Yes, it is a bar. Thank you. It's like I kept getting his name wrong. So Gabriel, uh, I can't really explain it. It's just uh, this, 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 this fabulous guy who just uh, uh, instinctively understands horror. And, uh, and I wrote the thing, and, I, and I'm scared to read it. I'm going, now, now we're talking. Now we're cooking here. You know, uh, so it has a distinctly different flavor from Vampirella, it's like you, you start with Vampirella, with my Vampirella, and then you, you, you turn up the seriousness notch, you know, about 10 notches. Uh, uh, so um, I'm really nervous about it, uh, neurotic about it. I've, I've really driven that crazy uh, because it's been a very tough working process because uh, the, the industry is so uh, unforgiving uh, and reticent to embrace new ideas that it's hard to penetrate and it's, and it's really tough for a book to find an audience. Now, once upon a time, you had six, seven issues for a book to find an audience and that's a real luxury these days. So we are really hoping against hope that, uh, that, that people latch on to this, this thing. Uh, uh, Jay Lee is, is a big help. He's uh, doing part of the story. Um, and he's turning in some fabulous work as well. Um, and, and that's kind of our booster rocket to get the shuttle into orbit, you know. Uh, but we are really just, uh, I am so hopeful about the book because it's, it's, it's a, an interesting exploration, not just of horror or vampires, but, you know, you know but of the human condition and, and using the horror uh, mythology as kind of a metaphor 
for what's happening in the world today. So it's it's a very complex and, and, and interesting book, and uh, uh, and I'm really hoping that uh, uh, that that people flock to it, that they they, they, uh, they that they take it on. Uh, real quickly, Ben Twelve Fifteen. Uh, it's a ghost story. It's a story I'm sort of modeling after my mentor, Denny O'Neill, uh, whom we lost fairly recently. So it's, it's kind of a special issue. Um, and uh, we're doing something with the color. You know, what I wanted to do was kind of, uh, what I really wanted to do was, was Jose Gonzalez in black and white line art, just like the original Vampire Run. Um, uh, we may be doing a, a single color uh, we're fighting over what color that will be, uh, 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 or we may be doing something else. Uh, there's a frame around the story, so the, the story takes place in, in two different time periods. So the frame, the, the beginning and the end of the story may be color, maybe full color, and then when we get into this horror, this this horror hotel, I'm calling it. Once we get inside the hotel, maybe everything's black and white in there. I don't know. We're still negotiating some of that stuff, but it will be kind of a one-off special issue. Uh, that uh, I, I'm hoping that uh, will be just uh, a memorable uh, uh, part of the run here. So we're looking forward to looking forward to that. And I'm as we speak, I'm two pages away from finishing the script, and it's like I I I, I I've gotten all the way here. I got 18 pages. I've got it all the way here, and I I, get, I can't solve this one problem. And uh, if you've ever been a, well, I'm, I'm talking to a room full of writers now, but for those of you who are watching this who want to be a writer. This is the part of writing that sucks, is that you're almost home and the car breaks down. So, you know, pray for me as I try to finish these last two uh, pieces and get it on Matt's desk tomorrow. <laughs> so, Lucio, as I mentioned in introducing you, your artistic input is absolutely ridiculous. And I believe the majority of your work, as you can see in the background, is using actual paint, though you also, yeah. as needed, can expertly touch things up digitally. I want to know first, how do you juggle this? And additionally, I want to kind of go to another topic is that recently, um, actually currently running, but maybe over by the time this airs, you did an exclusive crowdfunded variant cover with us for Vampirella to connect even more directly with the fans. So I want to know both kind of how you juggle all this craziness and also mm -hmm. how that experience has been for you. Okay. So uh, basically, I, I prefer and I love working uh, working with traditional art like this one. So I had real paintings with real canvas. I'm not a big fan of the digital art, but uh, it's uh, most of the time I must use digital art for going faster. So um, uh, when I have uh, uh, many covers monthly that. I try to to hit the deadline every time. So I usually work 90% with the uh, traditional techniques and then I use digital for uh, the post-production. So I take the scan of the art and finish and try to go faster, especially if there is something to correct and adjust. <clears throat> but uh, if I can, uh, I try to do all with uh, oil paintings or mixed techniques. Uh, because I'm a big fan of the old uh, master artists, uh, so I, I basically I live uh, into the museums uh, every month. Like uh, I go back and forth from the museums in uh, in Italy. I live in Florence, so uh, I go very very often every week uh, to museums to to study the old masters uh, from the Renaissance to the 19th century, 1800. And uh, I, I study and try to, uh, to catch this technique, the old uh, techniques, and uh, with the new and uh, modern subjects, like, as you know, like covers for, for Dynamite, uh, Vampire Lord Sonia. And uh, uh, I was talking about Frazette, like he was one of the first um, painters, illustrators that became a cover artist in the, in the, in the past years. And uh, he did like incredible uh, masterpiece that right now they're uh, in a museum. So my my goal for the future is to ha to have my my art uh, physically in some museum or some uh, uh, something that it will be forever somewhere like collectors and. Uh, I, like to compare like digital art and uh, traditional art is. Uh, 
digital is, is amazing because you can do go faster, you can do everything you want very fast and very easy. But at the end, it's, it's, everything is uh, it's digital. There is nothing that you can touch beside the print. And the print is not the same thing like uh, having an original oil tank. And so it's, it's great because you can go faster, you can retouch. If you have something to adjust, like let's say uh, the editor, uh, tomorrow there is the deadline and the editor say, okay, you have to correct uh, something, like change the background or change the costume or... So it's faster to go digital because it takes a few minutes or a few hours. Uh, and I, I can imagine, uh, let's say 30 years ago when uh, or 40 years ago when the, the illustrators has to correct something first, they have to repaint everything. So like cover with colors and redo everything again. So that, that must be really, really, really stressful. And uh, so right now it's, it's easier comparing with the, with the old, um, with, with, the, with the old artists like Frazetta or uh, Norma Rockwell, no? So I, I feel like uh, lucky for two reasons. First, because uh, I, I can use digital, even if I don't like, but uh, I, I feel lucky because I can, I can use it and, uh, and do even special effects or uh, adjusting and stuff. And also because I'm lucky because I work with the great art directors because they usually don't ask to re repaint everything or uh, like it, it's just like a few little corrections sometimes, but most of the time uh, uh, they are happy with my work. So I'm, uh, I'm very uh, relaxed and very, I, I enjoy a lot doing. Uh, so you were talking about that before and uh, it's amazing working with, with Dynamite that's one of the reasons because all the art directors are very easy and uh, most of the time we have a very good feeling uh, so I'm very thankful to to you guys because uh, uh, I don't feel stressed that every time I have to do covers even if, if I, even if I do many covers a month but uh, I can manage everything because uh, uh, it's kind of there is a good relation with everybody and uh, we, we they know that uh, if I'm uh, if they leave me free to to do uh, to use my own imagination, my own subject, I, I do better things than uh, force me to do something that that, that I don't like. So that, that's the basic thing for I think for all the artists. And um, to answer your uh, the other question about the the crowdfunding, I'm really really uh, shocked at like uh, how many people uh, was uh, joining this uh, crowdfunding. And uh, I didn't think about that. I, I, I never did a crowdfunding before. I, I did something, but through other um, people. And uh, but this is the first time uh, I do something like that, and uh, I'm really, really happy about that because I saw so many people and so many fans uh, that they, how you say, I don't know the word, but they they, they pledge, pledge it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. And uh, that's amazing because uh, there is a big, big uh, uh, amount of people that uh, love my art and I'm very thankful to everybody, very happy about that. So it's, it's been really fun because uh, when, um, when Danny Matt uh, told me about this crowdfunding, I, I wasn't very sure if it was like for me like a good, uh, I, I was a little bit afraid. I said, oh, maybe maybe it's gonna be uh, not good. So maybe people will not buy my stuff. But at the end, I'm very happy because there was a very big um, uh, answer from the people. So that that was great. It was fun. So we have to do more. <laughs> hey, Lucio. Can you say real Corinthian leather for me? <laughs> so, Sorry, sorry. Do you have the voice? I, I can say really well with this uh, help. Can you repeat this? I said, will you say real Corinthian leather for me? Ah. Uh. <laughs> it's not real, it's rich. Rich Corinthian yeah. leather. Sorry. Rick Uncle Montalban. Rick Uncle Montalban. He used to say this in commercial. He had a very strong accent. And it's a beautiful yeah, accent, yeah, yeah. but the way he says "rich Corinthian leather," so we yeah, no, I can't, I, I can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, 
Um, if I stay longer in the US, like for, for a long time, like when I usually go to San Diego, I stay like one or two months or three months. And then my, in a few weeks, my English starts going better and better. But now it's been so long, especially last time I was in, um, in the US was uh, for New York Comic Con. So it was uh, October last year. And then I got stuck here for uh, months uh, because of the coronavirus. So my, my English is getting, uh, is fading away step by step. So I have to, that's the first time I speak English in uh, how, how long? Like since October, it's so, so long, almost a year. <laughs> so oh, we have to speak more. So you have to call me sometimes so we can speak a little bit. And uh, okay. I don't get, my, my English doesn't get rusty. <laughs> All right. For those who don't know, Tom has worked with a ton of spectacular artists through the years, like I said, on Vampirella. We were able to bring back Buzz, who was the artist on the uh, stretches of the original Avengers Vampirella. He did some variant covers on the new series. And at the tail end of Tom's original run, Amanda Connor came on, and that's when her career kind of really blew up. And Tom actually gave, basically, gave Ed McGuinness a career with the Vampirella Strikes spinoff. So, Tom, if, if I would love if you could share that story of bringing in Ed. And additionally, how do you feel that how the art has been on the series so far with Michael Santa Maria filling in those shoes? Well, my, my Ed McGinnis story is pretty interesting because I had just moved to a small town in, Ma in Massachusetts from Boston. And I got this phone call. I, I, think I'd been, I think I'd been living there for like maybe a couple of weeks. I got a phone call and this little voice on the other end of the phone said, Mr. Snagoski, I want to draw comic books really bad. Can I show you my portfolio? And I was like, sure. Well, you know, you know who are you? <laughs> I'm Ed McGinnis. I live around the corner. So Ed came over with his portfolio and dropped it down in, in front of me. And it was really good then. He had done some, I think at that point, he had done some work for... Uh, London Night Studios with Everett Hartsell's company. He'd done some. He'd done some work for them. So we went out to lunch and talked to talk comics and things like that. And within, I, I guess, I think within a couple of months, I had him drawing because he did draw. He did draw one or two issues of Vengeance of Vampirella, and then he took over the uh, uh, Vampirella Strikes at, uh, for a couple of issues with me on that too. So yeah, so that was the Ed McGinnis story. He called me. Called me out of the blue. I, I don't even know how old he was at that point. I think he was maybe. I think it was maybe like 20. I think it was 19 to 20 when he, uh, when he came over. Um, but as far as um, other artists on, on Vengeance, so we had Ed, we had, I think Louis Small Jr. was on the first, the, the issue that I took over, issue two of just the straight Vampirella. And he was a terrific artist. And we had Buzz, Buzz drew a couple issues. And we had somebody named Caesar. He did a couple issues. Then a guy named Kirk Van Warmer who, uh, did quite a few issues, and he was terrific. He was really good. He brought he brought a real horror edge to the book. The book had a real dark, creepy look to it when he did it. Um, but the current guys, uh, Michael and Omi, who's the, doing the colors, they're terrific. They they are absolutely. They're from the Philippines, aren't they, uh, Ben? Uh, they, yeah, they are amazing. They 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 nail my scripts. Isn't that a great feeling, uh, Chris? When they when they nail the scripts, when, when, I'll let you know when that happens. Yeah. Oh, oh really? <laughs> <laughs> well, not, these guys are amazing. I mean, I, I I get their I get their page their pencils or even their layouts, and I'm like, man, you just you you just picked that right up exactly the way I I pictured it inside my head. So, yeah, Vincent, I, I couldn't I couldn't say I, I I'm not I I couldn't be happier with with uh, them on the book. Um, and even the color, the coloring, Omi's coloring is quite amazing. All right, we're coming towards the end. So here's a fun kind of fanboy question and we'll just not think too hard about hypothetical contracts and everything. Um, and I think both the writers and the artists will have different uh, perspectives on this. So Vampirella has tangled with a ton of characters and crossovers and guest appearances. She's hung out with Catwoman, Witchblade, Lady Death, Dawn, Xenomorphs, Kiss, the Archie comics characters. So if you could bring any other character to the table with Vampy, what are your picks? Deathstroke. <laughs> Deathstroke, Black Panther, you know? <laughs> the, the priest reunion? 
Yeah. <clears throat> I'd like. I'd. I'd love to do Vampire Hellboy. Though Mike. Though Mike would never allow me to do it, but I would. I would love to do Vampire Hellboy. It'd be great. Black, white, and red. Uh, books. <laughs> yeah, wouldn't that be great? That'd be awesome. Yeah. I, I'd love to do like uh, Vampirella in a biblical uh, story. <laughs> No, really. <laughs> I'm not joking. Like, imagine, like, uh, part of the Bible, uh, like, uh, Apocalypse, and Vampirella. Uh, there. Like, I would love to do that. It would be so fun. <laughs> well, I know it's a little bit crazy, but... Lucia, you know, my, my, my take on her origin is that she, she grew up in Eden. So I, I have a whole... I have my, my whole origin take is biblical, so... We'll yeah, but we <laughs> um, I guess my last one. No, Matt. Matt, you go. Or oh, you don't have one, do you? You want? No, me to... I do. I do. But I mean, it's kind of covered. And I mean, it's also. No, you order first. I don't know what I want. It's um uh, a bit of a nerd moment going looping right back to the Frazetta conversation. I'd like to see Vampirella in old school Conan, not the current Marvel Conan, but the old school style Conan. Be nice. So just, I mean, it's kind of being touched on with the Red Sonia stuff, sort of, kind of, not really, but uh, no, like old school, like, like nasty Conan, basically. So, <laughs> he's some dick. Oops, sorry. <laughs> yeah, he's a real Richard, isn't he? <laughs> That's fine. We'll edit that out. Matt, do you do you have a do you have an answer here? Probably Vampirella and the Barba Papas. All right. Now, now somebody actually knows who they are. That's fantastic. Yeah, I, I don't know what you're talking about. Hello. Vampirella and the Papas. All right. Now, one final uh, dumb quick question. Tom, will you come back again in another 25 years? I'm not leaving. I'm just going to keep doing it. All right. <laughs> He's, he's going to beat all the records. Gonna be, I, that's, that's, that's my goal, all the records. The only Vampirella rider in a wheel uh, with a walker. <laughs> all right, and very quickly, just final question. Where can fans keep up with all of you? If you've got social media or websites or anything like that, let's just close out with that. Uh, ChristopherPriest.com, very easy. Uh, <laughs> you can just Google my name. Uh, Twitter, Facebook. I have a Patreon that is locked down because I show boobs sometimes. Um, not mine. I draw them. Um, <laughs> the coffee has kicked in, guys. Um, uh, uh, you, you can search my name on any platform and I'm there, basically. So, yay, millennial. So. <laughs> I'm on Facebook and Instagram. Most of the things are on Instagram. Mm. Every day I post some uh, work in progress or sketches uh, and, and Facebook, then the, the two most uh, popular social media. Yeah, I'm on, I'm on uh, Facebook, I'm on Twitter, I'm on Instagram. I'm hanging out at the corner, <laughs> selling, <laughs> selling the goofballs to the kids. <laughs> Sometimes you gotta <laughs> do what you gotta do. <laughs> and Matt is in his bunker <laughs> watching his staff. You'll find me on MySpace. <laughs> I see you. All right, everyone. Thank you for joining the Vampirilla 50th anniversary year end grand finale. Here's to another 50 more. I want to once again thank all of our guests. And uh, have a great San Diego Comic-Con, whatever that means. Whatever that means. <laughs>